Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. If you remember last week, again, uh, this was after the resurrection, and then these two followers of Christ are walking probably west out of Jerusalem, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, appears to them and walks with them on the journey and explains to them and really gives them, as we talked about last week, uh, a course on himself. We'd call that a Christology course, how everything points to him from Genesis to Malachi, how it pointed to him, his, his death, his resurrection. And so we looked at that. And then at the end of our passage last week, it says those two followers of Christ went back to Jerusalem. They were getting a lot of cardio that day. They went back all the way, walking back to Jerusalem to share this with the disciples. Um, And that's what we're going to see this morning is as they're meeting with these disciples and they're talking in this room, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, appears. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this resurrection account from Luke chapter 24. And we pray that we would encounter the risen Christ this morning through your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there is an old English story about this wealthy family, a wealthy English family that owned this large estate, this large property and a large um, castle or mansion, this large house, uh, much like something you might see on, on some um, Netflix series or on TV or in the movies, some big English uh, property, manor with a wealthy family, aristocratic family, something you might all or many of you might watch. Well, living in this large country estate in England were a, a, a boy and his sister. They were elementary age. They were living in this house, and they were living in that house, this large, huge house, big property, uh, because their parents had died. As, as kids, their, both their parents had died, and they were living in this house, this large house that belonged to their wealthy uncle. Their wealthy uncle lived and worked in London, so he wasn't there most of the time, and so these kids lived in this large house, um, and the, the wealthy owner said, well, I'm not going to be able to be there to take care of my niece and nephew, so he hired two women to live and work at the house. He hired one older woman who was in charge of the meals, in charge of the house, basically upkeep of everything inside this large country estate. The second person he hired was a younger woman, and her responsibility was to teach, teach these kids, to essentially be a tutor, to be a school teacher, uh, a private teacher that would live in this house for this young boy and this young girl. So in this enormous English mansion in the country, this huge piece of property, you have a brother, a young brother and sister, an older woman living there, and then this younger woman who teaches the kids. And that's where the story gets a little interesting. That's where the plot thickens so to speak. Late one evening, right before, right at dusk, right before the sun was going down, the two children are in bed, and this young woman is walking around, uh, enjoying the property. This is her favorite time of day, and she's walking around the property, and it's a nice little quiet walk around, and she's kind of free from the noise and responsibility of the children. Some of you might relate to that a little bit, having a little break uh, from kids or from grandkids. And as she's walking around the estate that evening, something extraordinary happens in her life. And and I'll read from the story, quote, here's what happened. The children were tucked away in bed, and I had come out for my evening stroll. One of the thoughts that used to be with me in these wanderings was that it would be as charming as a charming story suddenly to meet someone on my walk. 
She continues walking and then says this, At the end of this long, hot June day, I stopped short from coming view of the large house. What arrested me on the spot, and with a shock much greater than any vision had allowed for, was the sense that my imagination had turned real. He did stand there, high up there, beyond the lawn, at the very top of the tower on the house. This figure, this person, produced two distinct gasps of emotion, shock and surprise. So she's on this evening walk and sees a figure, a ghost, on top of the house. And she is startled. She writes this. He was in one of the angles away from the house and with both hands on the ledge. After a minute, he slowly changed his place and he passed, looking at me hard all the while. I had the sharpest sense that during this transit, he never took his eyes from me. He stopped at the other corner of the house and even as he turned away, still markedly fixed his eyes on me. And then he turned away, and that was all I knew. She's on an evening stroll, thinking how nice it would be charming to meet someone, and she looks up on the tower of the house. She sees a spirit, a ghost, with hands clenched, walking around the top of the house. And she's startled. She's shocked. She is terrified. Think about if you were in that situation, not at your English mansion, but if you're at your house in Mount Pleasant or Charleston, and you come home from from church, come home from dinner maybe one night, and you're walking in, and you see a ghost on your house. How, how would you feel when encountering something like that, the supernatural? You'd probably be a little shocked, a little startled. If you have a ghost story, please don't share that with me. Uh, afterwards, don't, don't tell me about that. This woman was startled. She saw a person, but it wasn't a person. She wasn't sure what to say or what to do. She's overwhelmed experiencing the supernatural and just terrified. That's the feeling in in Luke 24. The disciples think they've seen a ghost when Christ enters the room, and they're shocked, they're startled, like this woman is in the story, seeing someone on the top of this tower in the house and not sure what to do. The disciples are in this room talking about things, and they're interrupted by what seems like a ghost, a spirit, a phantom of the friend they had known for years and walked the hills of Galilee with, and they're not sure what to do, just like we would not be sure what to do. Terrified fear, trepidation. And they're in that room talking because as we saw last week, remember Christ appeared to these two um, individuals who are walking down the road to this town called Emmaus and Christ showed up and talked with them and taught them about how the Bible points to him and then revealed himself to these two individuals. And then they ran back and went back to Jerusalem and they went back and they're in this room telling the disciples. And so as Christ appears here, before he appears, they're in this room, there's confusion, there's questions, what's happened? Does your story match up with this story? Peter's had a resurrection account. We're not sure what's going on there, what's happening. And so the context of this room when Christ appears, and they think he's a spirit or a ghost or a phantom, is there's rumors of a resurrection. We've got some different accounts that a dead man or dead friend is alive. That's the context. And Christ appears, and they're terrified. Verse 36, Christ says, peace, peace to you. In other words, don't be terrified. Shalom. Peace. Salvation is here. Peace is here. And so Christ recognizes their their trepidation, their panic, their anxiety, their fear, which is much like when, if you remember in Mark chapter 6, when they're out on the Sea of Galilee at night in their own small little fishing boat. Remember that story? And they see Christ walking on the water. They think they've seen a ghost or a phantom or a spirit, and they're afraid. And Christ has to say, peace, peace, it's, it's me. That's the same experience they're having here. They're not sure what's going on. They're overwhelmed with the supernatural. Is this Christ or is this, this looks like a ghost, a phantom, a spirit. Looks like him, but is he really here? Is is this Christ in the flesh? That's, That's kind of the questions that they have. And Christ knows them. He knows their thoughts. He knows their fears, just as he knows your thoughts this morning. He knows your fears this morning. And so Christ gives them, as Luke records it, gives them two signs. Christ gives them two signs to show, hey, I'm really here. I was crucified. I'm now alive. Two signs. The first is this. The first piece of evidence to help their feeble faith. He says, one, look at my hands and my feet. Come take a look. It's me. Like You can get close. You can approach. Take a look for yourself. Ghosts and phantoms and spirits don't have flesh and bones. They don't have hands that can grab things and touch things that make marks in the dirt when you walk. 
Take a look for yourself. And so he's inviting them to himself. Christ invites people to himself. The second thing he does is this, verse 41. He says, have you anything here to eat? Have you anything here to eat? And it's, the way this is written is very casual. Very casual. It reminds me, recently some friends were in town from North Carolina. And we had dinner. And we're finishing up dinner and the server's coming with the check. And my friend's wife had some food still on her plate. And so my friend, being a faithful husband and a hungry husband, said, are you going to finish that? Don't, don't box it up. I think I can eat that. Uh, and so he, you know, he's getting his fork ready, and he's getting that food on his plate. Don't box it up. I'll take care of that right now. Uh, are you going to finish that? That's really how this is described here. Christ is basically looking at someone saying, hey, are you going to finish that? You got, are you going to finish that food? That piece of fish that you're eating, Thomas, can I, can I? Don't box that up. I'll take that. That's really the casual expression that Christ gives. Are you going to finish that piece of food? Because I can eat that. And Christ does this, probably not because he has a voracious appetite, but because in, in that culture, in the Hebrew mind, they did believe in ghosts. They did believe in spirits. But ghosts and spirits wouldn't eat fish. They don't eat. So Christ is saying, give me, give me some food. Are you going to finish that? Let me finish that. You'll see me eat food and know that I'm, I'm, actual, I'm an actual person with hands, with feet, skin and bones. So he eats this fish in their presence to show them that he's, he's not a ghost, he's not an angel, he is here physically with them. And so as you step back, here's what's happened in the last two to three days here in Jerusalem. On Friday afternoon, Jesus Christ was publicly executed on a cross. Public record, everyone could see it. Most people didn't want to see it because it was gruesome. Most people would have fled. The disciples did flee. There are a few women who were followers of Christ that stayed and watched, we know. That was on public record. Here, this occurs on the same day as his earlier resurrection appearances. So this is Sunday. So here on Sunday, he's appearing physically. Not just, not just to one hopeful person in a quiet room. To, he's appearing to multiple people in multiple places physically. This is in public. People can record this. That's why we have multiple accounts of the resurrection in Scripture. It's not a fantasy. It's not a myth. It's not just, man, we hope this guy's alive. He appears in public to multiple people. So here's what you have. He was dead. He is alive. He has a physical resurrected body. And so that's the first point here. That, that is the main point this morning from Luke chapter 24, which is that Jesus has a new physical resurrected body after his death and resurrection. And more to the point, not only does he have that, but we see in Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ promises that resurrected new body to everyone who believes in him. That he is the first fruits of what will happen to each and every person that is found, as the Apostle Paul says, in Christ, that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You get what he has, a resurrected body. And that's the main point. And, and sometimes in, in Christianity we get maybe more focused on Christianity as uh, a set of rules to live by, or Christianity as ethics, or defining morality. And those are all true things. God does define ethics and morality. He's the creator. He should. We shouldn't. But more to the point, Christianity is about death and resurrection. Death to sin and life, eternal life, a resurrected body. What Christ has is promised to you. And that, that should be very good news this morning. And if you're ever kind of worn out with, man, my, my body hurts this morning, or I'm fighting this or fighting that, and just my body's falling apart, here are three references to write down that you can always go to in Scripture that tell you that what we see here in Luke 24 will apply to you if you belong to Christ. The first reference is this, Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's Romans 8, verse 11. Paul says, the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, He will give life to your mortal body, that body that's kind of slowly falling apart, not working that great day to day. The Holy Spirit will raise you up when your life is over, when Christ returns, the final resurrection. That's the first one that you can expect that the Holy Spirit who raised Christ will give you a resurrected body. The second reference is from, also from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes this, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. 
For as by a man came death, by a man, Jesus Christ, has come also the resurrection of the dead. Paul goes on to say in verse 53 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, For this perishable body, this body that we know is falling apart, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. The sting of death, Paul says, is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The law condemns. But thanks be to God, Paul says, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul can go on to say a few verses later in reference Isaiah chapter 25, Death, where's your sting? Not that worried about death anymore. Not that big of a deal. It's defeated. It's an enemy, but it's a defeated enemy. So here you have two references from from Paul, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, about a resurrection, a physical resurrection. Because of what Christ has done, we see it in Luke 24, that will apply to you. And just so we know, it's not just Paul saying this. It's not just Pauline theology. It's also Johannine theology, or the theology of John, the Apostle John. Revelation chapter 19, one of the final chapters of of Scripture. John writes what he's seeing and what he's hearing. He writes this in Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. And the angel said to me, write this down, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What does that have to do with resurrection? Well, what John is saying is that at the end of redemptive history, when the Lord returns and makes all things new, redeems his creation, is visibly in charge, there is a, a, a marriage supper between Christ and his church. Ghosts and spirits and phantoms don't eat at a wedding feast. Resurrected people do. Revelation 19 says you're going to get a new body. That is good news. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to be invited to a wedding feast between Christ and His church to celebrate, not us, but to celebrate what He's done. That means you're going to be there not as a a ghost or an angel or a spirit. You're going to be there with a body that actually works forever. It doesn't need daily maintenance and upkeep. That's really good news. That's what Revelation 19 says. At the conclusion of redemptive history, God gathers His people for a meal, food and drink to celebrate with their Redeemer. So in in Romans 8, Corinthians 15, Revelation 19, you see this. Christ has defeated death. Christ has risen from the dead, and he gives that gift of a resurrected body to everyone that belongs to him. That's the New Testament record, whether it's Paul or John. The New Testament record is Christ rose again, had a physical body publicly seen by multiple people. Read through 1 Corinthians 15 this afternoon to get a, a more, a full account of that. And that's a foreshadowing. Christ's resurrection is a foreshadowing of what happens to us because it's the same Holy Spirit who who raised Christ from the dead gives us a resurrected body. And that is good, life-changing news this morning. Very good news. One of the the things I really like about, or one of the values, I guess, of the Low Country that I like is the fact that here in the Low Country we do value health and fitness Staying in shape, exercise, getting outside, eating healthy, using the latest nutritional stuff, medical stuff, taking care of ourselves, trying to be healthy. That's something that is uh, noticeable in low country culture. And that's a good thing. Objectively, that is a good thing. God has given you one body. You should take care of it. What's interesting, and I might say what is odd, is that in our culture, while so many value in, in the low country, so many value their physical bodies and doing whatever it takes to stay young and vibrant, do this, do that. So many people, and I say this from experience, so many people don't stop to think. They're so concerned about staying in shape and staying young and healthy. They don't stop to think that there is going to be a day in everyone's life, there will be a day in your life when your body will wear out. doesn't matter how healthy you are. And a lot of people just don't think about that. And I say that from experience as a minister, as a chaplain, for, for years, there's so many people in our culture who don't stop to think that there's a day coming that my body won't make it to the next day. And I'm not trying to be negative, just trying to be realistic on that point, that you're not going to live forever. And the more I thought about that as I was writing the sermon, the more I thought, that's actually a really good thing. 
How many of you, as, as your body wears down slowly over time, how many of you would want to live to like 150 or 200 years old at the rate we're going, right? How many of you would want to? By the time you're like 200 or 250, you'd be in like a little pod, like with IVs strapped on machines, people come visit you in your little cryopod, right? That's what it would be. Nobody wants it. That'd be awful. That'd be like a horror film. You don't really want to live forever, not with these bodies that slowly wear out over time. And so a lot of people in our culture don't think about that. I hope you've thought about that. The, the other thing is that so many people don't think about, well, if I know my body's going to wear out, what could I do? How could I have a body that would not wear out? That's what Luke 24 is saying. There, there is a resurrected body that Christ has. So how could I have that? And the text here shows us that your body is going to wear out. What can I do to prepare for that, to have a body that will last forever? The thing you have to do is, it's not eating right, exercising daily, taking the right supplements, the latest technology, fitness clubs, all that kind of stuff, supplements. The thing you have to do, the Bible says, is you have to do two things. It's a two-step plan to get a body that will last forever. It is, number one, repent which means I'm, living, I'm going this direction living for myself. Repent means I'm going to go this way and live for the Lord. That's the first step in the process. And the second step is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. Peter's going to make a lot, a, a lot of use of that phrase in the Acts of the Apostles. Repent and believe if you want salvation. And that may sound easy, but and this is not really an exaggeration. Almost everything in our culture tells you not to repent. Almost everything in our culture says put faith in yourself or put faith in stuff, material stuff. It is a hard thing to do. In fact, if, if you look in Scripture, it's impossible without the Holy Spirit. You won't repent. You won't believe unless the Holy Spirit gives you a heart of repentance and faith. But that's how you have a resurrected body. Christ is the, the first fruits, the Apostle Paul says. And if you want that, it's repentance and faith, trusting in what Christ has already done for you at the cross. It's a gospel promise from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to you that you can't have that, that promise that we see here revealed in Luke 24. A few months ago, I, I was doing something very exciting. Very exciting. I went shopping for some shoes, for some running shoes, because we've got to stay in shape. We've got to stay healthy. So I needed, I needed over, the, over the spring and over the summer, to, there was a number of miles I wanted to jog. And so I was like, okay, my, my shoes are kind of wearing out, the running shoes I had, so I need to go buy some new shoes. So very exciting, bought some new running shoes um, because I want to do this many miles over the summer before the end of the year, before the fall. And so I needed some shoes for the job of running. Jesus gives a task for his disciples, a job. And he says, you're going to need equipment for that. Just as I needed equipment for the task of running, I need some shoes. If I'm going to stay in shape and keep running over this stupid bridge, I'm going to need some shoes for that. Christ says, the disciples have a task, which is sharing the gospel, and you're going to need, a, you're going to need equipment for that. And he uses the metaphor of clothing. You're going to need to be clothed with the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish this. So look at verse 49. After Christ reminds the disciples that he is, Christ is, the fulfillment of the entire Hebrew Bible, from the writings of Moses to the writings of Malachi, everything in there points to him. Gary was talking about that this morning uh, at 9.30, teaching on Zechariah. Zechariah points to Christ. It all points to him. And we were, he was teaching on that this morning. His death, his resurrection are the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. And we talked about that last Sunday. If you, if you were out of town last Sunday, that, that all those sermons are on YouTube and uh, on our website as well. Now in verse 49, Christ says, you're going to be equipped. You're going to have the equipment. The clothing you need is the metaphor for the task of sharing the gospel. And the clothing you need is you need to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to come on you like a garment, like a pair of shoes that you're going running. I needed shoes for the task of jogging, the disciples need the Holy Spirit for the task of sharing the gospel because, and this is a major sub point this morning, just the power of sharing the gospel is not in you or me. The power of sharing the gospel is in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how good or bad you can be at sharing the gospel. I'm not very good at it. I'll just admit that I'm not very good. I think that's something when we planned the church, me and Charlie were always kind of felt guilty about. We're, we're not like great evangelists. 
But there's a relief there because you might feel the same way. That the power is, is not in how good can I present the gospel. And it's good to not like be a jerk about it. But the power is in the Holy Spirit. The power is in the Holy Spirit to, to convert people. Jesus says, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit because Peter, you ain't good enough. Thomas, you can't do this. You're going to have a bad nickname, Thomas. You can't do this. They're going to call you Doubting Thomas. You're not going to be that effective. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you like clothing. And, and we'll see that in the Acts of the Apostles, the day of Pentecost. That will happen. Also written by Luke, that the Holy Spirit comes on the church and comes upon them. And it's very reminiscent. This afternoon, read Luke chapter 1. Remember, the angel appears to Mary and says, Mary, you're going to be overshadowed. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you're going to conceive and have a child. And that child is not just going to be any regular child. That child is going to be the Son of God. That's the same language here, the overpowering that Mary had of the Holy Spirit. That comes upon the church. Because the church doesn't have the task of giving birth to Christ. The church has the task of sharing the birth, the death, the resurrection of Christ with the world that is lost. And so here's the, here's the final point. The disciples, the church, need to be equipped with the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. The church, that is the people of God, you, have the gift of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel, to share what God has done through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit that empowers our witness, that emboldens our witness. And it's not just so that as Christians we can avoid sin. That's a good thing. You want to avoid sin. It's not just so that we can be Christ-like. That's also a good thing. We have the Holy Spirit not just so that we have a resurrected body, which is a fantastic thing. You have the Holy Spirit so that in addition to all those things, you might share the gospel with people in Mount Pleasant, people in Charleston, Daniel Island, North Charleston, James Island, wherever it might be. You have the Holy Spirit in order to share the gospel, to share the good news of what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ to others. So we are clothed in that sense with the Holy Spirit, have the equipment we need. We don't need another pair of shoes. We don't need more. We are are clothed with the Holy Spirit that was poured out at Pentecost 2,000 years ago so that we might share the gospel, so that you might share the gospel with the people that live next door, the people that you work with, uh, friends that don't know the Lord, uh, relatives that don't know Christ. And the the task is very simple. The task is just share. You don't have to get them to sign anything, pledge anything. Just share, here's what God has done. I know it. In my own life, I read about it in Scripture, and I want to share what Christ has done for me. Share the gospel. Share the good news. Share the fact that you know your body's going to wear out, and because of what Christ has done, we have the hope of the resurrection. Those are all really good things to share. That that is good news to share, that the, the power of the gospel is not in me or it's not in you. It's in the fact that Christ has died. He's risen again. And he promises us this resurrected body. He promises that our sins are forgiven, that we're adopted into his family. All those are gospel promises. And those are promises that are signified, represented in the bread and in the juice because of the death of Christ. And we have this sacrament because sometimes we hear the, we hear the gospel, we hear the word preached, we hear it and think, yeah, you know, okay. And God says, I know your faith sometimes is weak and doubting, and so I give you this sacrament to come alongside to support, to help your weak faith in a very tangible way. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, think about those gospel promises. Think about everything that God gives you because of the death of Christ, which is signified here uh, in the sacrament. Let's pray.